I'm just going to like wind back the years a little bit and explain um, a little bit about myself and what got me interested in what the possibilities um, of working on a research project like this were. Um, I, I spent most of my career until about 2012 lecturing about art and teaching about art with a whole variety of different types of audiences, mainly adults. And by around 2011, 2012, and most of my career was, has been spent with working with historical art as well. Um, and by about 2012, I had really got sick of the sound of my own voice. And I realised that as a visual art educator, the, the main thing that I did was meet groups and take them into museum gallery environments. But still, it was very verbal. So visual art education can tend to be very based upon talking, very based upon dialogue. Now the dialogue is great as long as you've got people with you who want to talk back. So that's where we were around about 2012 when we were rethinking what to do with some of our programmes at the National Gallery and how to give our audiences different alternative ways of engaging with the art. So I'm talking about existing audiences and for me one of the, and some of you are going to be familiar with this little bit of the story. I see, yeah, I see a smile on Roberto's face. Whereas like for me I consider this picture to be a friend, it's something I love. I've loved looking at Vermeer paintings for years and I found myself in 2012 in an awful lot of really tedious long meetings in the National Gallery about an exhibition that we were putting on called Vermeer and Music. So now, of course, the main reason for doing Vermeer and Music is because of the 36 or 37 Vermeers on the planet, most of them have got musical instruments in them. So, and it was a really interesting exhibition and all we talked about in those meetings was music. I went over and over and over about music and there was live music in the exhibition as well. And not piped through, there was actually live musicians in the exhibition and it was really quite extraordinary but I started to get quite irritated by all the talk of music because I'm not a music expert and I was being asked to programme um, a music education programme around this picture and okay so just take I'll shut up for a moment take a moment to look at this picture Vermeer's art is among the most resoundingly quiet art that we had in our collection. So we decided to experiment with our audiences and create a programme where people were invited into the gallery to sit in the dark in front of a picture on their own in total silence. And we were worried about doing it because, well, some of my colleagues did say to me, isn't this kind of <laughs> going to put us out of jobs? Because we are paid to be here and explain the art and talk about the art and you're proposing something completely different. And of course, a lot of work goes into creating the environment for a visitor to come into and have this completely quiet, still experience. And by the end of their time alone with the picture, they had started on their own without anyone asking them questions or telling them anything. They had started to unpick the composition and in my opinion, in exactly the same way that they would have if they'd engaged in a dialogue with an educator asking them very particular primed questions. So I just think that's quite an interesting example of how people's minds and the environment and the experience can lead them to have these thoughts and feelings without necessarily having to converse with a member of staff. And another painting that we um, explored that with was this one, which Betsy will be familiar with, uh, the, the, the only Bosch in the National Gallery's collection, perhaps not a typical Bosch, but unlike the Vermeer, which is quiet and has a great sense of space in it, this is a tense, claustrophobic feeling painting. Now I hope what you realise at this point is that I haven't, and I hope you don't feel like this, bogged you down with any art history because that's what we were trying to do with some of the experiments that we conducted based on these two pictures, was not turn them into art history lectures or lessons, but instead take the essential quality of a picture and then build an experience around it, whether it was an experience that was focused on 
sitting in silence or an experience like this one, and I'm afraid I don't have any photographs of this. The first iteration of Betsy and I working together, uh, which some of you will be familiar with, the B project, which did involve choreographed responses. In fact, Dante was involved um, in that. And we staged them as durational dances in the gallery spaces. Um, and that was something that I began to realise at that point, it was possible to win over some quite difficult senior members of staff about how we could create different things for our audiences to do. Again, I just want to remind you that the National Gallery, and this isn't a criticism of the gallery, it's a conservative institution. It doesn't take risks, and it has a collection full of stuff like this. So it's actually quite difficult to get all of the agreements in place to do anything that might seem a little bit out of the ordinary. But what we started to experiment with was the idea that we could move away from everything being about talks and lectures and into the realm of creating experiences that touched people's senses, their emotions and their compassion. For me, what was critical in Dance and Museums 1 was moving away from the idea that you might work with a dance artist in a historical art environment to ask them to respond or interpret the art on the wall. Because if you use that kind of language, all you're ever going to do is put them into a subservient relationship with the stuff on the wall. Does that make sense to everyone? So we, we did consciously start thinking about how can an ephemeral moving body coexist in an environment with something that is 500 years old and has been conserved and has been cared for um, in lots of different ways. How can there be an equal relationship? It's quite a good question to think about in this project and quite a difficult one. I think the other thing I wanted to sort of mention was that, because there was a lot of talk about collaboration yesterday, when, when you're thinking about getting the right ingredients together for a successful collaboration, don't forget that the other collaborator in your group is the art work in the museum because just because it can't speak or, or move or tell you what it thinks it's actually an active collaborator in the experience as well.